Hospital Management Association, Mr. Amitabh Dutta, to kindly take over. Nineteen fifty-eight marked the beginning of an idea, an idea to bring about how one views and understands management and its potential for meaningful interaction. This led to the birth of Calcutta Management Association or CMA, with Sir John Gere Gandhi, the then Director General of Tata Iron and Steel Company Limited, as the founder president. CMA today is a vibrant organization, as vibrant as the city it is located in. Affiliated to All India Management Association or IMA, the apex management body in the country, CMA today has a membership base of over 1,000, including nearly 100 corporates. True to its mission and vision to create a platform for the management community where contemporary management ideas can be conceptualized, formulated, developed and practiced. CMA over the years has organized a series of path-breaking meets, workshops, seminars, talks, interactive sessions and exchange programs. We at CMA have taken on the onus of covering a wide area Hello. from management education to management Hello. practice with the objective of fostering and developing excellence in management. All to Can help you hear me now? profit the mind. Can you hear me? Honey, we can hear you. All right. Uh, Hi, Sanjeev. How are you? Very well. Uh, uh, Welcome. I don't know. May I request Mr. Amitav Rathor to kindly deliver the introductory remarks and the welcome address and then after Mr. Anirudh Dulairi, past president of CMA, to kindly introduce Mr. Mehta. Mr. Dr. please. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to, the, uh, to today's webinar organized by the Calcutta Management Association. Ever since the onset of the pandemic, Calcutta Management Association consciously decided to keep in touch with the stakeholders, including members, practicing professionals, educationists, and students, and engage with them by providing relevant content using various digital platforms. As a part of this initiative, the Leadership Lecture Series has been the most successful and widely received. We've had eminent speakers like Mr. R. Gopalakrishnan, Mr. Mohandas Pai, Mr. Sunil Kant Munjal, Mr. Chris Kopalakrishnan, Mr. Arvind Panagaria, etc., amongst others who have shared their valuable thoughts about tackling the fallout of the pandemic. In between, we had other webinars, including one by the Vice Chancellors of the Eastern and Northeastern Region based universities, a presentation by the Group Chief Economist of the State Bank of India, and also by an eminent nutritionist. We also organized webinars under the conversation series where eminent personalities from the field of music, literature, entertainment, interacted with journalists, PR professionals, and academicians. Some of the participants were celebrities like Usha Uttar, Arun Lal, Amit Chaudhary, amongst others. We also had, as a part of the continuing education series, two successful workshops on subjects of contemporary interest. Today, we have the pleasure and privilege of having with us Mr. Sanjeev Mehta, the Chairman and Managing Director of Hindustan Unilever. And he will be speaking to us on new normals, sensing and shaping the post-COVID era. Today's session will be presented by Mr. Anurudh Lahiri, who has himself been associated with Hindustan Lever for nearly four decades, which included a significant stint on the board and positions in group, including global responsibilities operating out of the Unilever offices in UK and Holland. He was a president also of the Calcutta Management Association and also my superior at the Andhra Bazaar Patrika. Over to Mr. Lahiri. Oni, all yours. Mr. Lahiri. Hey, you're again on mute, Ani. Uh, 
have we got Mr. Lahiri? Yeah. Am I on mute now? Yeah. Yes, Can you yes. hear me? Yeah, yes. no, okay. Okay. yeah. So, good evening, Sanjeev. Sorry good for evening. this little glitch, you know. No, that's You're not it. as tech savvy as, you know, one generation behind all of you. Now, uh, Amitabho, uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity. Romain, ladies and gentlemen, it's an absolute pleasure for me to get this opportunity to introduce Sanjeev. Sanjeev is the chairman and managing director of the of India's largest fast-moving consumer goods FMCG, that is, company and one of the most valuable corporates in the country. But that's not all. Sanjeev also heads Unilever's business in South Asia, which includes India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and Nepal which has together a turnaround of uh, just under 7 billion euro. Um, Sanjeev is also, as, as, his, uh, as president of South Asia, Sanjeev is also a member of the Unilever Leadership Executive, which is Unilever's global executive board, which runs Unilever globally. Sanjeev has done his bachelor's in commerce in India, he is a chartered accountant, and he also completed his advanced management program from Harvard Business School. Sanjeev has been with Unilever for almost 30 years, 28 years to be precise. And of this period, the last 18 years, he has led businesses in different parts of the world. So he has been chairman and managing director of Unilever Bangladesh, I think 2002 to 2006. He's been chairman and CEO of Unilever Philippines, seven to eight, chairman of Unilever North Africa and Middle East, eight to 13. And from October 13, he has assumed his responsibilities of heading Unilever's business in India and India as a part of South, South Asia. Now, if that's not all, uh, and if you're still not overawed, then let me tell you something more about him. Uh, during his seven years that he has spent in Hindustan Unilever, in my days, it was Hindustan Lever, uh, the market capitalization of the company has increased from about tenfold, from 17 billion to dollars 70 billion. 70 billion dollars, from 17 to 70 billion dollars, making Hindustan Unilever the fourth most valuable company in the country. And during this period, HUL has won several awards and recognitions, including the prestigious Economic Times Company of the Year, and Corporate Citizen of the Year, Awards and Business Standards Company of the Year, Awards, Award. Forbes has rated HUL as the most innovative company in India and the eighth most innovative company in the world. Uh, and uh, Sanjeev is a, you know, I mean, apart from all this involvement with levers and building and running this great company and the Unilever's South Asia operations, Sanjeev that was not enough. So Sanjeev is also the director of the board of Indian School of Business, ISB, with which ABP in our days was quite intricately involved. He is the vice president now of the Federation of Indian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, the SPIKI. He is a member of the Bridge County Hospital Trust South Asia Advisory Board of Harvard Business School. And he chairs Zintio's India 2022, a coalition of top Indian and MNC companies and also co-chairs the advisory network to the high-level panel for sustainable ocean economy. That's rather unusual. Sanjeev is a doctorate. Well, he has been conferred the honorary degree of Doctor of Philosophy in Business Management by Xavier Institute. And this is the Xavier Institute of Management, Bhuvaneshwar. Uh, 
he was recognized the business leader of the year by the all india uh, management association you know part of that uh the he was the best ceo at judge best ceo multinational by forbes india leadership awards the management man of the year he year by bombay management association that's bma he is the ca business leader by uh, the, the, the institute of chartered accountants of india so he is the ca business leader and uh, the best transformational leader by the asian center for corporate governance and sustainability and business leader of the year by none other than the economic times the et group sanjeev is a firm believer and believe me because i know him i've heard him and i know his mind very well and he's demonstrated that he is a firm believer that doing well and doing good good are the two sides of the same coin so he propagates okay. the cause of compassionate capitalism have you heard of that well we'll allow sanjeev to let you into it sanjeev is married to mona his dear wife who too is a chartered accountant by training and they have twin daughters that brings up the family naina and roshni who have both who have studied at mit cornell and the harvard universities so that's the story of sanjeev mehta now i won't go i won't take too much of your time i could speak volumes but i won't do that because at the end of the day you come here not to listen to me but i'm sure you're spending your time and you want to extract every minute that you can listening to what sanjeev has to share with us thank you very much and thank you again for giving me this opportunity amita Mr. Mehta, yeah, yeah. Over to you. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Datta. Thank you, Ani. Thank you, Mr. Barua, for inviting me, and uh, thank you, Ani, for your very generous introduction. So, what I'm going to do today is I'll take about twenty-five, uh, thirty minutes. Leave enough time, yeah, for question and answer. and share my perspective uh, micro and macro long term and short term and some philosophical issues also as we go along you know starting like uh, addressing uh, members of uh, the oh, calcutta oh. management association i think the first i need to address the question is covid-19 a black swan event because there are many people who talk about it as a black swan event this is something which happens suddenly and unanticipated i'm afraid i do not agree that it's a black swan event i would rather agree with what tom friedman of new york times says that it is part of a herd of stampeding black elephants multiple predictable and economically catastrophic events these are events which we know are coming but as a society we have been in denial professor andrew cunningham from the zoological society of london had advised that the emergence and spread of covid-19 was not only predictable but it was predicted the presence of large reservoir sars cov like virus uh you know it comes from the culture of eating exotic animals in southern china in fact it was the un environment chief sorry can you all hear me i presume yes sir you are audible okay it was the un environment chief inger anderson who had said that never before have so many opportunities existed for pathogens to pass from wild and domestic animals to people and he had explained that 75% of all emerging infectious diseases come from wildlife so this is something which was waiting to be happen the something which we have always ignored 
So the question that would come to your mind, what are the other potential crises staring at us? The very clear, it is climate change, social and economic inequality, ocean and ecosystem collapse, water scarcity, amongst many other. Now, what is going to be the likely impact of COVID-19 on the global economy? Well, last month, IMF projected that the global economy could contract by about 5%. They expect the partial recovery to happen in 21. The G20 countries have taken an exceptional step through fiscal measures of nearly $11 trillion. And in many ways, this could put a floor under the global economy. It is very difficult to predict or project the impact of the virus on the economy as many variables are at play. It's the trajectory of virus in many parts of the country. We know in India, in our own country, it is moving towards 100,000 per day. Yeah, over 4 million people have been infected already and over 75,000 people have died. And a second major wave across the world could lead to further disruption in activities. The recession risk across the world is very real. But let us not take it as a foregone conclusion. Of course, many countries will be affected by the scar of the economic crisis. There would be labor market dislocations. This could lead to financial crisis, bankruptcies. Large number of children, about 160, in uh, over a billion children in nearly 160 countries, their education has been disrupted. So here we are talking about very clearly a risk which is not only economic, not only health, but it's a real societal crisis. Now, what's going to be the impact on the global trade? It's going to be massive. The total global trade is about $18 trillion. And uh, the projection is that it could be impaired by about 20%. And it would take at least 23, 2023, for the world trade to go back to the $18 trillion levels. Now, the crisis is also exacerbating the deteriorating US-China trade relations. And these are about $650 billion. And one estimate is that this could be impacted by about $100 billion. Now, while this is big, it is also a massive opportunity for India. This will also exacerbate geopolitical frictions. This has the potential to reshape the world. In recent years, we have seen a trend away from globalization with countries becoming much more parochial, inward looking. This has also accelerated the pace towards nationalist policies. Global and regional partnerships are being put to test. Multilateral organizations like WHO have been marginalized. Now, what are how is it impacting the consumer behavior? What I'm going to do now is pick up a few discernible trends. First is, of course, the COVID cocooning. Around the world, the consumers are retreating into their homes. This is a mass behavior change at a scale we have never seen before. This is about home cooking, home entertainment, home exercise, home education, working from home. The second big trend is e-everything. Now, everyone has moved online. You know, we couldn't have thought about I would be addressing the CMA online, say, six months back. Consumers are today spending more time connecting, com communicating, working, shopping, informing, educating, entertaining themselves all online. I believe that the what could have possibly taken three to five years would get adopted in six to nine months. The third is very clear trend towards clean living. Now, there is a fetish towards cleanliness today. Cleaning, cleansing, clean living, sanitizing, sterilizing, disinfecting, as a company, we used to spend crores of rupees trying to educate people on the right behaviors. 
I think right now, I think the world has conspired to ensure that people adopt the right habits without even being cajoled. The next is health and well-being. I think COVID-19 has raised the con consciousness that uh, you have to look after your health. It is physical health, mental health, boost your immunity, something or at an unprecedented level. The other is a contactless culture. Now, human touch is feared rather than cherished. And, you know, we Indians love to give hugs, etc. So it is all about social shielding, social distancing, self-isolation. And the last big trend I would talk about is value seeking. The fear, the anxiety, and people are shifting to more value-based shopping, low unit price packs. This is what is very clearly a pointer. Now, this is a crisis like no other. It is complex, it is interlinked, and it has brought a normal lifestyle to a near halt. Before the crisis, IMS was projecting that 160 economies will have register positive GDP growth. Now they are saying 170 countries will see their GDP decline. A banker, he recently analyzed the situation and very well articulated that historical global crises like wars, revolution, pandemics, they often feel like they've put history on fast forward. Processes that normally take decades, they play out and unfold in a couple of weeks. Coronavirus is the political, economic, and psychological event of a lifetime that will drive disruption and transformation for years to come. Therefore, what does this crisis mean for India? We have seen the latest GDP numbers for the June quarter at near 24% drop in the GDP. Unprecedented, unheard, never happened before. Even if in the next three quarters, the GDP doesn't decline or remains flat, we are talking about a negative growth of 6% for the year. But I don't think there would be a flat growth, certainly not in the September quarter. So there are different estimates. There is an Oxford McKinsey estimate which says that it could go up to minus nine. There is a Goldman Sachs estimates which says it could go up to minus, uh, uh, you know, double digit somewhere in the mid teens. So it is very clear that this year we will be severely impacted by the crisis. Then there are several sectors which have been very adversely impacted. The airlines, the hotels, the restaurants, the tourism. These are also sectors, and last but not the least, real estate. These are also sectors which create a lot of employment. The fiscal cost of support is going to be substantial and it will raise the debt levels. However, I believe that at this stage of the crisis, the cost of not doing will exceed the cost of doing. Now, before I talk about what India should be doing from a medium to long-term perspective, I think it's very important to just pause and reflect on a seven decades journey that the country has gone through. When India got its independence, we had no coffers. It was virtually empty. If I take the GDP of the country in 1947, and adjusted for today's prices, the total GDP of India was less than the market capitalization of Hindustan Unilever today. So you can understand how small the economy was. And in the first four decades, we grew at three, three and a half percent with the population growing at one and a half, two percent. So the per capita growth and in income was just about one to one and a half percent, you know, which was famously called as the Hindu rate of growth. It is only in the last three decades after the liberalization that we have ramped up our growth rate to an average of six and a half percent. And all of us as Indians rightfully felt very pleased when the economy touched nearly three trillion dollars. That was a moment of great pride. We were the fifth largest economy in the world. But yes, while it is uh, clearly justifiably our 
you, you know, hearts should swell with pride, but one should realize that on a per capita basis, it's just $2,000. So we as a nation, it's very important that we dream big, think big, and act big. Now, I believe that if we play our cards well and convert what is a crisis into a big opportunity, then not just $5 trillion, we could well be looking at $10 trillion in the next 12 to 15 years. Now, what do we mean by $10 trillion? First is $10 trillion would mean that we would climb up from a developing nation status to a middle income status. The other important bit would be, we can't reach $10 trillion if our growth rate does not cross the chasm that exists between the six and the six and a half percent that we have delivered on an average over the last 30 years and move up to the eight and 10 percent data potential and uh, uh, the, the nation needs really. Uh, eight to 10 percent growth rate could generate about 10 to 12 million jobs every year. And that's the kind of jobs we need to gainfully engage the youth that comes into the employment sector every year. In the last five, six years, we have been able to create just about three, four million jobs a year. So it's even very important for us from a social perspective that we are able to ramp up our growth rates. Now, what I'm going to do is share with you some thoughts I have on what the country should do and what the nation should do going forward. First, very importantly, it goes without any uh, much debate that we have to protect our people. As the economy opens up, the risk of getting infected will also rise. And the best way today to contain this pandemic is, till a vaccine is developed, is the time-tested public health principles of contact tracing followed by testing and treatment, quarantine of suspect cases, and the sound public health hygiene practices of cuff etiquette, use of mask, frequent hand washing with soap and water, and if I may say so, life boy soap, or use sanitizer when a soap is not available, and physical distancing. One of the primary reasons why India went in for a very hard lockdown is the fragile nature of our healthcare. I think this is a moment where India should move money towards building the healthcare infrastructure in the world. A quantum shift in reach, quality, and affordability is required and should be, the money should be spent. Together with the healthcare, we also have a fabulous opportunity in the Indian pharma industry, which is the third largest in volume and the 11th largest in value. It is about $41 billion. An equal amount comes from exports. Uh, a half is from domestic and a half comes from exports. This is an industry where revenues could potentially cross $100 billion and our global share could move up from 3.5% to 7%. Now, the, global the Indian pharma industry has been doing a tremendous job of ensuring that there is an uninterrupted supply of drugs during these times. But we also face a challenge in the pharma industry, which is an over-dependence on the active pharmaceutical ingredient on China. And one of the thing India will have to do is move back the manufacturing of API from China back to India in a very big way. But we can potentially become the affordable and quality healthcare capital of the world. Just like the Y2K crisis at the beginning of the millennium, gave an impetus to the Indian IT industry, COVID-19 should be used to give an impetus to the Indian healthcare industry. The second is make technology as a game changer. This has accelerated India's digital journey. Many of our fellow citizens have started going online for the first time to either buy or to get news. Our children have tasted online education for the first time. Collaboration tools, just like getting into uh, today's event, it has moved us away from a state of theoretical debate to a hands-on experience 
and the real state of what can be delivered by technology. We should leverage this momentum. Quality shift in education, new business models, move technology in manufacturing to get precision manufacturing, environment management, agriculture, all this could be given a massive impetus. We should use data as a national asset and not get entrapped in walled gardens of the West. The third, I would say, is transform agriculture. You know, agriculture doesn't read, get much uh, column inch in newspapers because they are not listed companies. But 50% of the country's population of workforce is still dependent on agriculture. And agriculture contributes just about 17, 18% of the country's GDP. Now, various studies have indicated that we lose 10 to 30% post harvest management because of poor post harvest management. This is because of deficient warehousing, cold chain, logistics, and processing facilities. At every disintermediation, intermediation stage, we lose 5 to 7%. India's yield today is 60 to 75% of the global best. We also know that when you process fruits or canned vegetables, you can multiply by the value by 50 to 500 times. Yes, today, India's gross production of food grains has reached about 300 million tons. This year, it's been a good harvest and we might breach the 300 million ton mark. It is also true that the gross calorie intake of a population has gone up significantly over the years, and it is now slightly less than the 2,400, which is the recommended daily intake of calories. But the challenge we have as a nation is quality of nutrition. We consume calories in a very unbalanced manner. More of simple carbohydrates and much less of protein and micronutrients. And that is the reason we have a massive issue of malnutrition in the country. India can become the granary to the world. India's share of global trade in agriculture and horticulture is just about two and a half percent. A small country like Netherlands is the second largest exporter of agri and horticulture products in the world. Just think of the potential that exists. But this will require extensive use of technology, building of infrastructure, traceability from farm to fork, cluster approach, empowerment of FEOs, and very importantly, bringing in large and organized players to agriculture and horticulture. The fourth very important bit is reinvigorate manufacturing. The challenge that we need is we need to look at it from a lens first of reforming the factors of production land, labor, and capital. The land today is expensive in the country by nearly 20 to 25%. If I look at the cost of borrowing in the country, it is more by 400, 500 bips as compared to other uh, peer group countries. If I look at the cost of logistics, it is again 500 to 60 bips higher as percentage of GDP. So it's very important for us that we focus on bringing about the needed reforms in India when it comes to the factors of production. The other important bit is the scale matters. In India, there are only 600 companies with a turnover exceeding 3,500 crores. And a share of GDP of these companies is about 30, 35%. But if you look at peer group big countries, the big companies constitute nearly 60 to 70 percent their turnover of the GDP of the country. So it's very important that we give a boost to the big companies who bring in innovation, they adopt technologies, pay better, and very importantly, will be able to raise the productivity gap in the country. The next very important bit in manufacturing is we have to accelerate disinvestment. India's public sector enterprises are generally inefficient and will find it very difficult to compete. Moreover, the government needs resources to kickstart and accelerate growth. Last but not the least, the focus on small and medium enterprises, so important. After the financial crisis in the US, it was the SMEs which gave a boost and created 60% of the jobs in the country. 
We have millions of micro enterprises, but these are neither job creating nor resilient. We have to protect them, give them technology, ensure that the finance is available. Just a few days back, I was attending an investor conference in Gujarat, and I was so pleased when the chief minister said, in Gujarat, the SMEs don't have to first take permission. He said, first production, then permission. This is the kind of focus we need to bring in everywhere. Last but not the least is, we will have to focus on preserving the financial stability of the nation. The loan book of the banking industry is about 100 lakh crores. And the total capital is about 11 to 12% of the loan book. Just think of it. If the pandemic results in another 4 5% NPAs, our capital structure of the banking industry could become very precarious. We have to move towards creating a bad bank where we could transfer all the NPAs and they could aggressively pursue recovery of NPAs and set up an infrastructure bank who can get into funding of infrastructure in a very big way. Now, let me address some other issues which are so important for the society at large. First is, we have to strengthen globalization. Despite the pushback to multilateralism, India should play a very proactive role in moving to a more collaborative world. All of us need all of us and, and not some of us. The reality is that this crisis is neither a one country problem, nor one country can solve it it will require the collective efforts of the world community. And this can be done only when we come together. The second is what I call as moving to compassionate capitalism, which Ani referred to and which I'm very passionate about. It was Winston Churchill. I, I'm not a big fan of Winston Churchill, but his quotes are somewhere sometimes absolutely fabulous. He said, the inherent vice of capitalism is the unequal sharing of blessings. The inherent virtue of socialism is the equal sharing of miseries. Now, virus has been a big leveler when it comes to sharing of miseries. It does not differentiate between the rich and poor, between the urban and rural, between the developed and the developing world. However, the aftermath or the after effect is very severe on the poor who lose their livelihoods, and the developing nations who will struggle with the meager resources. Mahatma Gandhi had rightly said, the rich must live simply so that the poor can simply live. I'm a capitalist, ladies and gentlemen, let me be very clear. But I, and I believe that the best way to allocate resources is through capitalism. But we cannot have the current model of capitalism with its unidimensional focus on shareholder value creation. The history of business in India reflects the ethos of compassionate capitalism, and this is what we need to pursue and innovate. The other bit is we need to progress decisively on climate action. COVID-19 could potentially halt the progress on climate action. Remember something, as far as the COVID is concerned, we will get a vaccine. But when it comes to climate change, there won't be a vaccine. So we have to be very decisive. We have to get away from procrastination and half measures and work together to flatten the climate curve, take concrete steps to better manage the water resources, keep plastic away from the environment. India could and should take a lead in renewable energy with the same passion as we undertook the electrification of villages. Then the next bit is be adaptive and real, resilient. We have realized that even the best prediction models, we cannot predict our way to a no risk world. This therefore means that we have to become far more adaptable. The crisis has shown adaptable teams retool in a matter of days. Successful organizations with vast prediction capabilities get paralyzed if they have not been able to adapt. Just as there is need for business to build adaptability, so is there need for nations. Last but not the least, 
I'll talk about leadership. The coronavirus has been a test of leadership, test of character for millions around the world. To successfully navigate this crisis, leaders must get comfortable with ambiguity and chaos, recognizing that there is no playbook available. There's nothing that you could rely on. Instead, they should commit themselves to navigating through the turbulence, adjusting, improvising, redirecting. Courageous leaders also understand that they may make mistakes along the way, and they will have to pivot quickly, learning as they go, but not being deterred by failure. The job of a leader is to provide brutal optimism, a clear account of the challenges, but also a credible hope that they have the strategies and resources to overcome this crisis. The job of a leader is to lift moods and spirits of the people, channelizing the energies toward better performance, which in turn can spur the economic growth, save jobs, and lift the society. So let me end by reiterating my belief in human ingenuity and a capacity to change. I believe that when humankind decides to change, there is no limit to how fast or how dramatically we can change. But first, we have to decide to change. This is about choice. This is not about a capacity to deliver. Each and every black elephant can be tamed. We have the technology. We can create the financial resources. We have the intellect. We have the humanity. And we have the instinct to survive. As India, we should look at it. This crisis as a massive opportunity to craft a different and a better future, a country that is fairer, a country that is more inclusive, a country that is more equitable, greener, more sustainable, healthier, smarter, and very importantly, more adaptable and resilient. On that note, ladies and gentlemen, I would be delighted to take any questions you may have. Shinoi, can you? Uh... Yeah. Mr. Beta, uh, good evening. I'm Priya Shinoi. I'm the vice president of the Management Association. And I must confess, it's like uh, drinking off the water hose in full blast. Thank you for, uh, uh, for the wonderful work which you have just contributed to the as, as I was uh, going through your uh, points, uh, Mr. Mehta. There are plenty of questions which are flowing in and still flowing in as a scene. But for all our listeners in here, we have just had a master class and a few points which I'd like to reiterate to the listeners. Something like it was something like this: with the kind of COVID which has uh, impacted us, there's a 500 billion dollar more an opportunity for India. And what more better than use this opportunity? The COVID cocooning this is a term which is wonderful to hear. And I guess there are lots of opportunities coming our way in the area of COVID cocooning as well. The e-way, the cleanliness, the health and well-being, the contactless culture, value seeking, so many opportunities and so many new trends, mega trends which keep coming up are something worth emulating for. Mr. Mehta, as I connect the dots between the points which you mentioned, and I see questions are flowing in, uh, and I'll hit the road uh, running. The first question which comes from the director is, uh, uh, from Mr. Barua, is some, goes like this, like uh, something like this. We did discuss what crisis means for India. We also heard what crisis means to a leader. And the word which you did touch upon, uh, Mr. Mehta, was a leader must have total optimism. So in your experience during these days, when you had uh, to lead HUL through such a COVID, uh, such through challenging times, and the points which you mentioned, how did you as a leader lift the morale and spirit of all the people spread across? If you could just throw some light on that. Thank you. Thank you. A very valid question. 
You know, during these times, I think one of the things we have to do is communicate relentlessly with our people. So I have been communicating with people in small groups, big groups, town halls, and also on an individual basis. The second important bit is we can't run away from reality. So we have to paint what the true picture is. We can't be telling the people that, yes, everything is hunky-dory. No, we have to paint the picture that it is tough times. But at the same time, everyone craves for leadership. People are wanting to know how would we as a company come out stronger. The third important bit is these are moments when leaders have to show compassion. You have to reach out to people. You have to help them. Everyone has their own fears, their own apprehensions, their own problems. What could we do best to alleviate them? Hold their hand, help them in the need most. That's what the leader has to do. And as far as my company is concerned, we focused on five big things during the crisis. First is the safety of our people. And when I say the safety of our people, not just the 21,000 who work for us, with the 220,000 people who work in our ecosystem. Even for our distributor salesmen who run into thousands, we provided insurance for them so that they have a safety net for them. The second important bit we did is focus in ensuring that there are supplies. We manufacture many things which are so vital, soap, sanitizers, foods, refreshments, so we went out of our way and the people were, worked with a higher purpose. When they were manufacturing soap, it was not just about a bar of life wire lux. It is about saving the nation. Knowing that the cost of one wash with the soap can kill the virus and it costs just 10 paise. Just think of it. In this bigger crisis, and that's what the people were working towards. The third important bit was having a pulse on the demand, the behavior. What are the consumers thinking? What is the behavior change? What is the shift happening? The fourth important bit was helping the community. We are an integral part of the community. The community looks at us. We were the first amongst the first companies which earmarked 100 crores for COVID relief. And we were very focused. It was boosting the healthcare facility in the initial period. We got scores of ventilators imported into the country. We got 75,000 testing kits in the country when the country was facing severe crisis on testing kits. We helped build isolation facility together with Apollo Hospital when we didn't have isolation, many isolation facilities in the country. And then we reached out to the poor, millions of poor, we have given them sanitation, hygiene kits, food kits, the migrant workers. And last but not the least is having a massive focus on cash and cost. Now, cash and cost is very important. We are a zero debt company. Thankfully, we have a great business model. We are cash rich. But we have to ensure that the entire ecosystem survives, not just us, all our partners, all our distributors. And that is the focus we brought into the business. And our aims are very clear. We want to come out stronger after the crisis compared to when we entered the crisis. Mr. Mehta, I, I, I can reflect and echo the thoughts, what you just mentioned. I work for the House of the Tatars. And, and, and imagining what you have just said through, it was like a replica I was going on in my mind. And I, I just take to the, the I just take the dot again and try to connect what you mentioned about uh, you have twenty one thousand employees, but more importantly, the distributors, the retailers, the last guy on the field who sends in your knife boy soap at the retail counter. Uh, during these days, I I feel you know, and it's my personal experience. My relationship with my local Kirana has got that much higher. Oh, absolutely! I'll see, that's such a valid question, uh, uh, Mr. Shinoy. You know, there are, as far as the channels are concerned, two things have stood out. One is very logical and intuitive, which is e-commerce. Yeah, whether it is marketplace model, whether it is grocery.com, that has really blossomed. The other is people have realized 
the benefit of the humble grocer, your neighborhood Kirana store. I call it the renaissance of the grocer. Yeah, people have suddenly realized the benefit of proximity. What we as Hindustan Unilever have done is, first is, we have uh, trained lakhs of retailers into how they could be running the operation, keeping the highest standards of safety. Yeah, the social distancing measure, what they need to do in their store, etc. We have trained them on it. The second important bit we have done is connecting them digitally. So we have got now 240,000 stores in the country who have adopted a Shikhar app so they can place an order on us even when a salesman doesn't visit them. And the adoption of technology by a grocer has gone up significantly after the crisis. So I think if we look at this, uh, this entire uh, Kirana store ecosystem, we have about 10 million stores in the country. 10 million stores means about 100 million people. The bread on the dining table is brought by the Kirana stores. So not just from an economic perspective, even from a social perspective, we need the Kirana stores to survive and thrive. And one of the best things that we could do is digitally connect them, bring the signs of retailing so that they could move up the value chain. So... That uh, Viresh Jain was a question, and this is S. Gupta, uh, how, how do the local Kiranas combat? I think, uh, in my personal opinion, the Kiranas have come out a winner, perhaps even beating the online guy who could perhaps who could deliver you where you wanted it. Absolutely. And just think of it, you know, we have also developed an app for a Kirana store, we call it My Kirana, where as a consumer, you can get into it as a place they order, and they will send the man and deliver to you in 30 minutes. Yeah, with no e-commerce guy can do it. So I think as a nation, we need to help the Kirana stores to survive and thrive. And this would be a new business model for the nation. Yeah, in most of the countries, developed nation, they've all moved towards modern trade and e-commerce. India will be a country where we could have the modern trade, e-commerce, and Kiranas coexist and survive. On, on that point, uh, Mr. Mehta, just take it forward to the business model, which you touched upon that the entire business model has evolved, the supply chain is evolved. And here this uh, question comes from Joy Chakravarti, uh, Iman Ghosh, uh, who talk about how have been the trends in the rural area. So while Unilever is quite big in metros, of course, you've got a big chunk coming from the rural, how have the business models evolved there? You did talk about farm to food. Uh, the, 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 yeah. the you know, rural reforms have yet to take place. There is a bit of resurgence in the rural demand. And that is for reasons which we all understand. The government has increased the Manrega daily payment. The government has increased the Manrega outlay. The government has uh, given them direct transfer of cash. The government has given them free food grains, which are absolutely right. Because the first job of a government is to protect the poor people. And they have done the right thing. And also the Kharif crop has been pretty good. Yeah. But these are not the fundamental reforms. And what I talked about, those are the kind of reforms we need to do. See, we also have to understand that Indian cities do not have the infrastructure that we can absorb large scale migration. We cannot. So that makes it even one more reason why we need to bring in reforms in agriculture sector, drive up the value chain over there, increase the range of products, the quality of products, the yield of products, and very importantly, we should become one of the major exporters in the agri and the horticulture sector in the world. That would then mean that we have made a difference to 60% of the population who lives in rural India. That, that's uh, an interesting thought. And I, I can connect again the point which you mentioned, dream big, think big, and act big. And I think a message for India. And I'll just connect that with another point here, what Sachin Joshi mentions. And he talks about 
uh, we have so much of not anti anti china sentiment but the world is perhaps looking for look beyond china and there's a 500 billion dollar or perhaps more play yeah so for india what why you did mention about healthcare agriculture what are the other opportunities this throw up now see, see let us accept that when global companies they look at diversifying the manufacturing base india will not be the only country in their horizon yeah it will be countries like vietnam thailand which are often spoken about but people do not often speak about are the east european countries who have a very strong manufacturing base so as a nation we will have to compete on cost quality service and innovation all together and let us also accept we can't be good in everything we will have to identify sectors with the government and the private sector should then jointly develop so that we have the capability to compete with the best in class let me give you an example if you look at the boston area of us the innovation system on biotechnology it comes from institutes like MITs and Harvard, it comes with the R and D centers of the global big pharma companies, and it comes with the government support. They together have created an innovation hub. Same goes with the Valley. You have an innovation hub over there. So India will have to identify sectors and then create the infrastructure and the wherewithal where we can compete with the best in world. no one will come to india because they love our culture or love our bollywood songs yeah they will come to india only if we are able to be better than china compete with china on the dimensions that i spoke about cost quality service and innovation uh mr mehta you know we're really running we are actually well across the time of what we have but i can see another 5 minutes yeah I, i think i'll take at least two three more questions uh, and see what how we can kind of uh, take it forward uh, there's a question which comes in here saying uh, again maybe uh, reading again what we perhaps discussed this comes in from shantanu chakravarti asks my local kirana stores how will the poor guy compete with big basket amazon spencer as a gone online they also provide discounts and other benefits such as i buy and i get one one by one free so uh, is there a road to the end of it somewhere or, yes, or is, absolutely. is there something good end no absolutely you know that's what i'm telling you today unfortunately what has happened is the kirana store guy operates with his gut feel yeah he doesn't go by the science of retailing he doesn't even have the right assortment for the neighborhood in which he operates he buys what a good salesman goes and sells to him not what he needs to stock and sell and our job is to help him first is adopt technology and it's a very simple thing today we have got very cheap smartphones he can have a shikar app over there and he can start placing an order not between the two salesmen and whenever between the two sales visit he gets out of stock he can do it the other is we have to understand like i sit in mumbai for instance a kirana store in south mumbai should have a totally different assortment to a kirana store in dahisar today technology allows you to customize your assortment to each store and that is what i'm talking about for a kirana store to compete they will have to bring in the science of retailing they can't do it alone the onus is on companies like us to help them and that is what we have embarked on in a very big way uh, maybe a couple of last questions mr mehta uh, and that some this this comes from look for an opportunity behind every crisis i think that was one of the quotes which you did mention and and how is that we can take on so what is your advice to a supply chain of farm to fork products how how was it to be worked on did you all sense an opportunity here during these times oh absolutely you know i gave you a statistics 
in India, anywhere between 30, 10 to 30 percent of the farm produce gets destroyed in the supply chain. Yeah, again, India will have to focus on, you know, today what has happened? In India, we have the herd mentality. Poor farmers, they don't use technology at all. And if they see that the price of certain pulses, certain grains was good, so that everyone goes and grows that in the next harvest. They don't even see whether you're a water-starved area. So you end up consuming. In a water-starved area, you start growing uh, water-intensive crops. Yeah, we have to get away from that. And we will have to have a cluster approach which part of the country we should be focusing on what it is. What is the next level of technology we bring in to improve the... We have given a thought paper to the government that how do we bring in growing of palm in the country? As you know, palm oil India is one of the biggest importers of the world. And we import somewhere in the vicinity of six to seven billion dollars. But palm oil cannot be grown by small farmers. Palm will require organized farming. So the approach to agriculture will have to change if we have to bring in prosperity to 60% of the population who live in rural areas. And that's the reason I'm talking about basic reforms will have to be done. Essential Commodities Act, all that will have to be. The government has embarked on the reforms. They have done some reforms, yeah, but much more is required. They say that never let go of a crisis and perhaps it's an opportunity for uh, each of us to leverage upon this crisis. Uh, well, Mr. Mehta, well, you have had a stint across the world. You were in Bangladesh, the Philippines, in North, North Africa, uh, Middle East. Uh, and when you look back upon your career so far and now here, uh, is there anything that you would uh, like to share with our team, with the people over here who are connected in the yeah, CMA? No, you know, during my period, uh, one has faced different kinds of crises. When I was chairing Unilever Bangladesh, we had the second Gulf War. And all the Muslim nations were up in arms against uh, British and American companies. And in Bangladesh, we were the flag bearer of foreign investment. So that was a big crisis for us. When I was uh, running the business in North Africa, Middle East, which were 20 countries from Oman in the East to Morocco in the West, we had the famous, infamous Arab Spring. And all of you would remember how from a fruit vendor in Tunis, the entire region went up in flames. Yeah. And again, you have to bring in that same attitude. There is an opportunity lurking at every corner. As a corporation, as a business, as individuals, and as a nation. And I think this is what if we focus on as a nation, we could transform ourselves. We could realize the potential that exists in the nation. And as a born optimist, I believe India will not let this opportunity go. On, on, on that note, Mr. Mehta, on the optimism note, and a quote from your end, a leader must have brutal optimism. For, for, for all the listeners in here, we have been having students, we have entrepreneurs, we've got SMEs, we've got corporates, we have got institutions, we've got management institutions all connected here. What we have just witnessed is a masterclass. Thank you, Mr. Mehta. Uh, and I think what you stand by humility and ambition, I don't know how you pronounce it, ambition, is uh, right. uh, 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 has been actually demonstrated in the last hour. Uh, Thank you so very much, Mr. Mehta, for being with us today. I think it's been a fantastic session. And I'll leave, uh, I'll leave you all with a fantastic quote. The rich must live simply so that the poor can simply live. Uh, Mr. Mehta, thank you again. And with that, uh, wish you all good night. And thank you again. Good night, everyone. Absolute pleasure speaking to you all, sharing my thoughts. Look after good yourselves. Good Mr. Mehta, thank you safe. very much. Thank you very, very much. Amitabh. Amitabh, can I just take yeah, a please. second? A couple please, of please. seconds. Um, Sanjeev, I wanted to just add my own, my own word of thanks to you. I have to be very uh, frank and share with everybody 
that you did not require any persuasion. When I said that, look, we would like to listen to you, you readily agreed, and it was a question of only fixing the date and the time, which was done. So, Sanjeev, it was lovely listening to you once again. It was a fantastic session, and I congratulate CMA, the present committee, for having organized this wonderful uh, event. Thanks very yes. much. And thanks Ani, to you. Ani, it is because of my love for you and the people of Tamil <laughs> No. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Everyone, take care. Thank you very much, Mr. Mehta. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Good night.